Hello, so in this little clip, we're going to look at three-dimensional spherical polar coordinates. So we've already seen that if you solve the Schrodinger equation with a central potential, i.e. the uh, Coulomb interaction between an electron and a proton at the heart of a hydrogen atom, then the symmetry of the potential uh, dictates that the best coordinate system to use would be spherical polar coordinates, um, rather than Cartesian x, y, and z. Uh, you could do it with Cartesian x, y, and z, but it's going to be a mess. So let's not do that. Let's use spherical polar coordinates, apart from the fact that some of you haven't really seen them before, or if you have seen them maybe in a slightly more fundamental way, whereas I want you to be able to actually use them and do useful stuff. Like, for example, uh, an example we're going to do here, we're going to integrate uh, a wave function over all space to show that the probability really does equal 1. So the first thing to do is to set up the coordinate system, just as we have already done in lectures. See so here I've got z, x, and y. And I have some point, which has got coordinates x, y, and z. I'll drop a perpendicular down to the bottom. Perpendicular across the top. So I could read off x, y, and z if I wanted to, but I also want to express this in spherical polar coordinates. So I have two angles. First angle, theta, the angle from the z-axis. Second angle, phi, is the angle from the x-axis. And then we have the distance r, r, phi, and theta. All right. So let's say uh, you have gone off and you have bought yourself a cricket ball or football or net ball or some other spherical object. You've just bought the earth. And you want to know what the surface area is because you want to paint it for some reason. So you need to know how much paint to buy. So you know the Cartesian uh, expression for the area. It's the square root of the surface. It's the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared must equal r squared. So you could integrate up dx, dy, dz if you really wanted to, but that, again, would be horrible. So we're going to use spherical polar coordinates as a more natural system to do this integral to work out the surface area of a sphere. So what we need to know, so let's draw, here is the uh, Earth. Here we go. And I just need to consider a small bit of area, dA, and all I need to do is A is just adding up all my little DAs, and that will give me the total area of my sphere. Easy peasy. So we just need to define what DA is, and then, uh, and then we're nearly, nearly done. So let's draw some coordinates again. It'll get a bit too messy to put it on the other um, axes. So let's take a line up here, a line across here. So again, I got size r and a little angle d theta. Here's theta, d theta. So this side is just going to be r d theta. So now I just need to know the other side. So there's my little area, da. So what's the length of this second side then? So this one you have to be slightly more careful with. So if I project this back onto the z-axis, like so, then this angle is going to be d phi. I have a right angle in here, because I'm projecting this onto the z-axis. So I'll just draw a little triangle of this thing out here. What have I got? I have got theta down here. I have got this distance r. And I have a right angle in here. I have a right angle triangle, so you can do some trigonometry. And this side is going to be r sine theta, which means that this length is going to be r sine theta d phi. So now we know both the uh, width and the height, or whatever you want to call it, of our little area. So I can now write that dA is equal to, so I've got rd theta 
r sine theta d theta, so I've got r squared sine theta d theta d phi. So that is the area of my little area. That's the area of my little area, yeah. Right, so what I need to do is add them up. So this is fairly straightforward. Uh, so the area is going to be the, the integral. So now we need to know the limits of the, int of the integral. So theta is going to go from 0 to pi. And phi is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Get your limits right. This is the way we defined it, and this is the way it is. Of r squared sine theta d theta d phi. So, as an exercise to the reader, integrate it. So r squared is a constant. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little. I'll do. I'll start it off for you. Uh, so I could write this as r squared the integral of 0 to pi of sine theta d theta and the integral of 0 to 2 pi of d phi. So this equals 2 pi and this equals, uh, what's the thing of a thing? 2. There we go. Convince yourself that that integral is 2. It's just integrated up to get cosine. So the area is going to be 4 pi r squared. Uh, we have calculated the area of our sphere, 4 pi r squared. Again, sometimes in textbooks, so maybe you've done this before, uh, what you can do is you can integrate around phi first and essentially work out what a, a sort of band, uh, a small band, the area of a small band, and then you add up all the small bands. So that is just like doing this integral first and saying, that's now a small band, let's add them all up, and then you do this integral second. It's the same thing. Um, I sometimes get very confused as to whether I should be integrating up little cubes or, or little squares or bands. Little squares always win the day, and they always make sense to me. And once I've done that, I can work out why my lecturer is trying to get me to integrate up bands. It all comes from this fundamental uh, small unit of area. Now, you're all thinking, what about volume? What is the volume of this sphere? What is the volume of the Earth? <clears throat> so if we go back to our drawing. Oops. So now I need to consider a small volume somewhere inside my sphere. There we go. And it's going to have area dA and it's going to have width. That's very simple. dr. That is the width because that is now perpendicular. So it's just on the radial component. I could draw it on this picture. Maybe I should use a different pen. So then I could draw it sticking out like this. And that side is dr. And that's going to give me the volume. So I can write that the uh, small volume, dv, is going to be r squared sine theta d theta, d phi, d r. And that gives me my small volume. So again, we can integrate this. So what is the volume then? So I need to integrate phi from 0 to 2 pi. I need to integrate theta from 0 to pi. And I need to integrate r from 0 to r equals the radius of my sphere, big r, whatever that might be, of r squared sine theta d theta d phi d r. So again, I can split this all up. 
the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, the integral of 0 to pi of sine theta d theta, and the integral from 0 to big R of R squared dr. So the first one just equals 2 pi. The second one is going to equal 2. And the third one is going to equal 1 third r cubed. Put them all together and I get 4 thirds pi r cubed. 4 thirds pi r cubed. Oh, sorry, you haven't seen any of that. Um, so I can split this integral up. Something to do with phi, something to do with theta, something to do with r. Do the maths, work out what these are. Not very complicated. And then multiply them all together, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I can work out the volume of my sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. And never again do you ever have to remember the volume of a cube. You just have to remember dv is equal to r squared sine theta d theta d phi dr. Draw a little picture. The only tricky thing with 3D coordinates is to get this length here, you have to project back onto the z-axis. And then you get r sine theta d phi. So that's the only tricky bit that every five years, if I don't do this, I will forget. So why would you, might, why would you want to work in spherical polar coordinates? Well, let's say I have a wave function, psi. Then I know that the probability, probability of finding my particle anywhere in space must equal 1. There must be some chance of finding my particle somewhere in space. So I could take my wave function. I take the complex conjugate times the wave function. That gives me the probability. And these wave functions could be a function of r theta and phi, multiply them by r squared, sine theta, d theta, d phi, dr, take the integral from r equals 0 to r equals infinity, now I'm doing it across the entire universe, from uh, theta equals 0 to theta equals um, pi, and the integral from phi equals 0 to phi equals 2 pi, that integral must equal 1. So that is my, uh, that an integral must equal 1. So generally you don't quite know what the sort of prefactors for these wave functions are. So Sorry, I could write that as phi r theta phi complex conjugate. So they're both functions of r theta and phi, which is why we're using this coordinate system in the first place. So I know that there must be some probability of finding my electron uh, in all space, and that probability must equal 1. So that gives me my normalization constraint. And very often, we don't quite know the, um, the sort of prefactor of a wave function. We just know it's fun the functional form. And then we can use this to uh, work out what the prefactor must be, or why it must be what it is. Um, with that, I'll finish and say good luck with the coursework.